Greetings, this is Brother Eli with another episode of Bible Truth Revealed. Today we will examine Genesis chapter 3 to discover whether it was an actual serpent that deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden, or whether it was Satan. Was it an actual serpent that deceived Eve, or was it Satan? Let's start by reading Genesis chapter 3, verse 2, to establish the context of the passage. I will be reading from the Brenton Septuagint. Genesis chapter 3, verse 2 in the Brenton Septuagint is verse 1 in the KJV. So verse 2 in the Septuagint is verse 1 in the KJV. It reads thus. Now, the serpent was the most crafty of all the brutes on the earth, which the Lord God made. And the serpent said to the woman, Wherefore has God said, Eat not of every tree of the garden? Many people like to spiritualize the first few books of Genesis instead of accepting what they plainly state. So let's examine a few key words to see what this verse is about. In the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, synonyms for the word brute are animal, beast, and creature. Synonyms for serpent are snake and viper. And synonyms for crafty are cunning, devious, scheming, sly, and tricky. So the statement The serpent was the most crafty of all the brutes on the earth. Simply means that the snake was the most cunning of all the animals on the earth. At this point, skeptics are likely to respond. But surely you don't think that a snake actually spoke. Because snakes don't speak. It is true that snakes don't speak today. However... The passage clearly states that the serpent spoke to the woman. So the real question is, did the Most High actually allow a snake to speak? This is not the only instance in the Bible of the Most High allowing an animal to speak. Let us look at Numbers chapter 22, verses 27 to 30. For another example of the Most High allowing an animal to speak. That's Numbers chapter 22 verses 27 to 30. And it reads thus. And when the ass, that's a donkey, saw the angel of God, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam was angry and struck the ass or donkey with his staff. Verse 28. And God opened the mouth of the ass. That means that God allowed the donkey to speak. And she says to Balaam, What have I done to thee, that thou hast smitten me this third time? So here we have a donkey speaking to a man. Just like in the Garden of Eden, we had a snake speaking to a woman. Verse 29, And Balaam said to the ass, or donkey, Because thou hast mocked me, and if I had had a sword in my hand, I would now have killed thee. So the man is responding to his donkey, just like the woman Eve in the Garden of Eden responded to the snake. Verse 30, And the ass says to Balaam, Am not I thine ass? Am I not your donkey, on which thou hast ridden since thy youth till this day? So we know it's a real donkey, because the context tells us it's a donkey. This is the donkey that Balaam rode all his life, from his youth until this very day, that he's speaking to his donkey. It continues, Did I ever do thus to thee, utterly disregarding thee? And he said, no. So we've just seen Balaam having a conversation with his donkey, just like we see the woman having a conversation with the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. So the answer to the question is, yes, the Most High actually allowed a snake to speak. 
Verses 3 to 14 of Genesis chapter 3 tell us that the serpent deceived the woman into eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, although the Most High had said not to do so. She then gave the fruit to her husband and he also ate. The rest of the chapter details how the Most High punished the man, the woman, and the serpent. There is no mention of a punishment for Satan because this chapter has nothing to do with Satan. Christians and Christian lights claim that Satan took the form of a serpent and deceived the woman. However, that is adding to the word because the book of Genesis never even hints at that. Genesis chapter 3 verse 2 in the Brenton Septuagint, which is verse 1 in the KJV, states that the serpent was crafty. It does not say that Satan was so crafty that he took the form of a serpent in order to deceive the woman. Instead, it compares the serpent, which is an animal, to all the other animals on the earth and state that of all those animals, the serpent or snake was the most crafty or cunning, devious, scheming, sly, and tricky. In other words, the serpent did not need to be possessed by Satan in order to deceive the woman. It was a crafty creature. In verse 14, the woman told the Most High exactly who deceived her. Let's read that verse. Genesis chapter 3 verse 14 in the Septuagint is verse 13 in the KJV. So I'm reading Genesis chapter 3 verse 14 in the Septuagint, which is verse 13 in the KJV, and it reads thus. And the Lord God said to the woman, Why hast thou done this? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The serpent deceived me. Not Satan in the form of a serpent deceived me. The author of Genesis chapter 3 tells us that the serpent deceived the woman. Eve herself confirmed that the serpent deceived her. Yet Christians and Christian lights who were not present in the Garden of Eden insist that it was Satan who deceived the woman. For a better understanding of who Satan is and why he never goes against the Most High's commands, please listen to my teaching entitled, The Revelation of Lucifer. The Revelation of Lucifer. Now let's examine verses 15 to 16, which tell us about the curse that was placed upon the serpent. We will discover that no curse was placed on Satan because Genesis 3 has absolutely nothing to do with Satan. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 in the Septuagint is verse 14 in the KJV. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 in the Septuagint is verse 14 in the KJV and it reads thus. And the Lord God said to the serpent... Because thou hast done this, thou, that's the serpent, are cursed above all cattle and all the brutes of the earth. So the serpent or snake is cursed above all the animals of the earth. We are only talking about animals in this verse. It continues. On thy breast and belly thou shalt go, and thou shalt eat earth all the days of thy life. We can deduce from this verse that snakes did not crawl on their bellies before this curse. Otherwise, the curse would have been pointless. Also, snakes did not have their faces on the ground, quote-unquote, eating dust before the curse. 
The result of the serpent's curse is that snakes now crawl upon the earth. If snakes already crawled on the earth, on their bellies, eating dust before the curse, this curse would have been a waste of time. Pointless. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 in the Septuagint is verse 15 in the KJV. That's Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 in the Septuagint, which is verse 15 in the KJV, and it reads thus. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall watch against thy head, and thou shalt watch against his heel. Before explaining this verse, let's look at the definition of the word seed. The Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines the word seed as progeny, offspring, children, descendants, as the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. In this sense, the word is applied to one person or to any number collectively. That means the word seed could be used to refer to an individual or a group of people, regardless of the number of people. And it continues, and admits of the plural form, but really used in the plural. When the definition states that the word is really used in the plural, it simply means that it is very rare that the word seeds with an S on the end is used instead of the word seed without an S. So when we see the word seed, it's the context that tells us if it's referring to an individual or it's referring to children offspring, descendants in general. In the same way that the seed of Abraham means the children of Abraham, and the seed of David means the children of David, thy seed simply means thy children, the serpent's children or offspring, and her seed simply means her children or offspring, the woman's children or offspring. This verse explains that not only would that particular serpent be the woman's enemy, but its seed or children or offspring would be enemies of her seed or children or offspring, otherwise known as mankind human beings. This is why people, human beings who live in snake-infested regions, are constantly on the lookout, watching for the snake's heads. And the snakes are also on alert, watching for people's heels. Because the snakes now crawl on the ground, we have to be careful that they don't strike at our heels, which is the nearest target. And they have to be careful that we don't step on their heads. Notice that the Christian doctrine of Jesus Christ being the seed does not fit the context of this passage. That alone should be enough to persuade genuine truth seekers that it is yet another failed attempt by Christians to inject their false god and idol Jesus Christ into the Hebrew scriptures or Old Testament. Truly repentant Israelites should be more concerned with discovering the truth of the Hebrew scriptures than with holding on to the false doctrines of Christianity. And that includes Hebrew Israelite Christianity with its abominable New Testament and its black Jesus. Are there any Christian Bible commentaries that are honest enough to admit that Genesis 3 is about an actual serpent or snake and that it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ? The Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges is a Bible commentary 
that was first published in 1893. That's over 100 years ago. Let's see what it has to say regarding this issue. Quote 1. Upon thy belly. It appears from the sentence that the story considered the serpent to have been originally different in appearance, which means it looked different, and mode of progression, which means it traveled differently. Its crawling movement on the ground and the apparent necessity for its swallowing dust are regarded as the results of the curse pronounced in the garden. Meaning what? Before the curse, the snake did not crawl on its belly, swallowing dust. That was the result of the curse. Quote number two, all the days of thy life. It says, not the individual serpent, but the whole serpent race. This is talking about the serpent's seed, the children of the serpent. These words, together with the details of the curse, conclusively show that Jehovah is addressing an animal and not the spirit of evil. So we are being told by the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges that it was an actual serpent, an actual snake, and the evidence is actually in the text that the Most High God was speaking to an animal and not the spirit of evil, not Satan. Now let's consider the commentary in verse 16, which deals with whether Genesis 3 had anything to do with Jesus Christ. So, quote 3 says this, Commentators used to see in the words, Thou shalt bruise his heel, a prediction of the sufferings and crucifixion of our Lord, as, quote-unquote, the seed of the woman. And in the words, It shall bruise thy head, the victory of the crucified and risen Son of Man over the forces of sin and death. We are not justified in going to the full length of this interpretation. Used to means that they no longer see in Genesis chapter 3 a prediction of the suffering and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Used to means that Bible scholars now know better. We are not justified means we have no good reason to continue to tell this lie to the masses. But let us go to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary and look at the definition of justified to see exactly what they're saying. Definition of justified. Having or shown to have a just, right, or reasonable basis. In other words, the dozens of biblical scholars and theologians who contributed to the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges agree that they have no just, right, a reasonable basis for claiming that Genesis chapter 3 has anything to do with Jesus Christ. Remember that this commentary was first published in 1893. This means that before 1893, biblical scholars used to believe the Christian doctrine that Genesis chapter 3 is a prophecy about Satan versus Jesus Christ. However, since 1893, it has been widely known by biblical scholars that Genesis chapter 3 has absolutely nothing to do with Satan or with Jesus Christ. So the million dollar question is, if this is clearly stated in such a prestigious Christian Bible commentary, 
Why do pastors who went to seminary keep lying to their followers? The answer is quite simple. Because the masses must never know the truth. If the children of Israel were to discover the truth about Genesis chapter 3, they may start to question other things. And in the process, they just might wake up from the deception of Christianity in all its forms, including Hebrew Israelite Christianity. And that would be bad for business. Quote 4 from the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges says this, There is no prediction of the personal Messiah. I'll read that again. There is no prediction of the personal Messiah. In other words, Genesis 3 is not a prediction or prophecy of a personal messiah. In fact, Genesis 3 has absolutely nothing to do with Jesus Christ because he never existed. For a better understanding of this fact, I recommend my teaching entitled Jesus Christ Never Existed. Jesus Christ never existed. After carefully studying Genesis 3, it should be clear that the serpent was an actual serpent, just like the man was an actual man and the woman was an actual woman. This is why the man, the woman, and the serpent were all cursed. The Most High did not curse Satan because Genesis 3 has nothing to do with Satan. I pray that the children of Israel will study the Hebrew scriptures or Old Testament for themselves instead of simply believing the lies of Christianity. It's time to wake up, repent from idolatry, and return to the Most High God only. And with that, I say Shalom. And remember, if you find these teachings beneficial and would like to learn more, please like, share, and subscribe.